Good afternoon. I'm Chilton Varner, President of the Supreme Court Historical Society. It's my honor to welcome you to our program today, which honors Law Day. It will be delivered by Professor Joel Richard Paul, a well-known scholar who focuses on the court and the Constitution. As many of you know, Law Day was established by Congress in 1961 to celebrate each year on May 1, the rule of law. This year, the Society is joining in the 60th anniversary program by the lecture that you will be hearing. Professor Paul's lecture is entitled The Relevance of Chief Justice John Marshall. He's going to talk for about 30 minutes. He will then take questions from our audience. If you have a question, please submit it by way of the question and answer feature on your Zoom connection. Jim Duff, the executive director of the society, will review the questions and present to Professor Paul as many of them as we can. Now, a little bit about our speaker. Professor Paul is the Abramson Professor of Law at the University of California, Hastings Law School, where he teaches constitutional law. His most recent books are entitled, first, Without Precedent, Chief Justice John Marshall and His Times. A second book entitled, Unlikely Allies, How a Merchant, a Playwright, and a Spy Saved the American Revolution. That latter book was named one of the best books of 2009 by the Washington Post. Not one to stand still, Professor Paul is currently finishing a book on the rise of American nationalism before the Civil War. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker today. Professor Paul, if you will join the virtual podium, you will now be in charge. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and for that introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to, to give the Law Day lecture here on the greatest Chief Justice, John Marshall, who did far more than most people realize to secure the rule of law and the independence of our judiciary. Over the last couple of years, following the publication of my biography of John Marshall, I've had a chance to speak to many different groups around the country. Frankly, I didn't expect this kind of response to a book about the Supreme Court, but the events of the last several years, culminating in two impeachment trials and the January 6th insurrection, have shaken some people's confidence in the rule of law and in our judiciary, and they're looking for reassurance. It's an occupational hazard for historians to draw historical parallels and make predictions based on past experience. History may repeat itself, but historical patterns are not predictive. With that caveat, let me suggest the following. A wealthy presidential candidate launches a populist campaign against the cultural and political elite on a promise to disrupt Washington to realign our priorities and shake up foreign alliances and trading relations. He attacks his opponents by spreading lies and innuendo. A foreign government intervenes in the election on his behalf, and he's swept into office on the wave of rural discontent. Once elected, he accuses his political rivals of treason. He attacks the press, disparages the judiciary, and disrespects Congress and the norms of his office. The country is deeply polarized, and many Americans fear that the president himself threatens the rule of law and the Constitution. I'm speaking, of course, of Thomas Jefferson, who was elected in 1800 with the support of revolutionary France on a populist program to drain the Washington swamp, replace the Federalist judges, shrink the national government, and return power to the states. That 
was the situation that Mar John Marshall faced when John Adams uh, appoint a, a lay, then a lame duck president uh, in his final month in office appoints John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Marshall did not really want this job, uh, but he took it because no one else would. With all due respect to my hosts, the US Supreme Court was a professional dead end. In 1800, the court heard an average of six cases a year, mostly cases of little consequence. Justices spent most of their time riding around the country, hearing circuit cases and taverns and having to share beds with strangers. The Supreme Court was so insignificant that the designers of the Capitol forgot to build a courthouse. The Marshall Court met in a nondescript Senate office, a Senate committee room on the ground floor of the Capitol building, which they had to share with the district court and the circuit court. The Supreme Court didn't have a home of its own, of course, until 1935. Marshall and the Federalist judiciary faced an implacable enemy in President Jefferson. Jefferson had personal as well as political reasons for hating Marshall. Jefferson was Marshall's second cousin and their families had feuded bitterly for two generations over the inheritance that Jefferson's father had appropriated from Marshall's grandmother. Perhaps Marshall got even with Jefferson by marrying Polly Ambler, who bore a striking resemblance to her mother, who just happened to be the woman who broke Jefferson's heart when she rejected his marriage proposal. They were implacable enemies. It fell to John Marshall to defend the independence of the judiciary against the Jeffersonians who now controlled both houses of Congress as well as the White House. The one thing that most people know about Marshall is that he invented judicial review. Now, Marshall invented a lot of law, but he did not invent judicial review. Some state courts had already asserted the power to strike down unconstitutional laws, even before the constitution was written. And in the ratification debates for the constitution, it was generally accepted that the Supreme Court had the power to declare laws unconstitutional. Not even Jefferson contested judicial review. Now you may recall that William Marbury is one of the midnight judges appointed by President Adams in the last hours of his presidency. Marbury's nomination as a justice of the peace for the District of Columbia is confirmed by the Senate and the Secretary of State who just happens to be John Marshall. And he is responsible for delivering it on the last day of Adams administration. But Marshall is busy packing up his office. He's preoccupied. He doesn't get around to delivering the commissions for the justices of the peace before Jefferson is sworn in the following day by the new chief justice who happens to be John Marshall. Jefferson finds these commissions and orders his secretary of state, James Madison, not to deliver them. So Marbury files a lawsuit in the Supreme Court asking for a writ of mandamus ordering the Secretary of State, Madison, to deliver the commission. In his decision, Marshall first holds that Madison broke the law by refusing to deliver the commission, and then holds the court has no jurisdiction to hear the case anyway. Marshall finds that although the statute under which Marbury filed his lawsuit granted the Supreme Court original jurisdiction over writs of mandamus, he claims that Article Three of the Constitution forbids Congress from expanding the court's original jurisdiction and therefore the court has no jurisdiction and they dismiss Marbury's case. Now, this case has puzzled legal historians for generations. First, Marshall knows 
that the courts are not supposed to decide the merits of the case if they don't have jurisdiction in the first place. So why does he hold that Madison acted illegally in refusing to deliver the commission? Second, the plain language of the statute did not grant the court original jurisdiction over writs of mandamus. Marbury's attorney, Charles Lee, simply filed the case in the wrong court. But Charles Lee is too smart to make a mistake like that. So perhaps he misfiled the case on purpose. Third, William Marbury is a wealthy bank president from a fabled Maryland family. The justice of the peace is a lousy job. It's even worse than being a Supreme Court justice. It pays nothing. The job entails arresting prostitutes and drunks and deciding petty cases for less than $5. Marbury doesn't really want this job. He doesn't need this job. So he's got to have some other motive for taking this case to the Supreme Court. Finally, Marbury cannot prove the commission was issued because Madison refuses to participate in the case and provide him with a copy of the commission. And the only witness to the commission is John Marshall, who can't exactly testify in his own court. So Marshall's brother, James, who is a district court judge, signs an affidavit attesting that he meant to deliver the commission, but he forgot. None of this makes any sense. In my research, I discovered evidence that suggests that the whole case was a setup. Chief Justice Marshall, his brother James Marshall, Charles Lee, and William Marbury sat down and plotted the case from the beginning to create a vehicle for Marshall to assert the court's authority against the threat posed by the Jeffersonians. Charles Lee purposely filed suit in the wrong court to give Marshall the opportunity to assert jurisdiction over the Secretary of State and to affirm that the court also had the power to strike down acts of Congress. Madison, who so disdained the court he didn't even bother showing up for the trial, would have refused any order to deliver the commission. So it would have made the court look ineffective if they had issued the writ of mandamus. And so instead, Marshall beats a strategic retreat. He avoids a confrontation with Madison and Jefferson while establishing the precedent that has survived two centuries. What Marshall did in Marbury was far more important than confirm the power of judicial review. Marbury established the most fundamental principle of our legal system that no one is above the law, not even the president and his cabinet. All of them, everyone, subject to the court's jurisdiction, and even the president can be held accountable. That is the essence of the rule of law. In cases like Marbury, McCulloch, uh, Cohen, Martin, Marshall boldly asserted the supremacy and the independence of the judiciary at a time when Jeffersonians wanted to rid the judiciary of all Federalists. Indeed, Jefferson asserted that he should have the power to hire and fire judges at will. Just imagine where we would be today if presidents had that kind of power over the judiciary. Marshall's decision in Marbury versus Madison has unfortunately obscured his other contributions to our legal system and to our Republican form of government. Marshall established the principle that federal law and treaties and federal courts are supreme over state law. He interpreted Congress's power to regulate commerce broadly in the hopes that one day Congress would regulate slavery out of existence. He declared that international law is part of our law and must be read into any act of Congress 
He defended property rights and the rights of private corporations and colleges. <clears throat> you know, prior to Marshall's opinion in Dartmouth College, there were only a handful of private corporations in the United States. And within a decade afterward, there were thousands. By the time Marshall retired, there were more than 20,000 private corporations with total authorized capital of more than $6 billion. That was all Marshall's work. He defined the, the rights of Native American tribes and he upheld the right to occupy and to use their tribal lands free from interference by the state. And Marshall protected the rights of aliens, even enemy aliens under our constitution and international law. In fact, no member of the founding generation has, a more, has had a more enduring impact on what our Republic has become than John Marshall. And, and no one did more to preserve the delicate union of our fledgling Republic at a critical moment. Marshall's leadership elevated the federal judiciary as a co-equal branch of our federal government. But how did he succeed against the overwhelming power of the populist Jeffersonians and later the Jacksonians? Before Marshall, all the justices issued decisions in seriatim. There was no unified decision of the court. Marshall thought that the court must speak with one unified voice. It was therefore necessary to hammer out a single opinion. And to that end, Marshall insisted that all of the justices share the same rooming house. For most of 34 years, the Supreme Court lived together, ate all their meals together, and especially drank together as a fraternity of brothers. Hard to imagine the justices today rooming together. That kind of sounds more like the plot of a reality TV show or maybe an Agatha Christie novel. As a result, over 34 years, the Marshall Court issued 1,129 decisions, all but 87 of the court's opinions were unanimous. And about half of all the court's opinions were authored by Marshall himself. That's an astounding record. But what makes it even more extraordinary is that every justice appointed to the court after Marshall was appointed by a Democrat Republican president who opposed Marshall's federalism. And, and yet with his powerful intellect and his considerable charm, Marshall managed to find common ground in almost every case and forge a unanimous decision. Marshall had a gift for inventing new legal concepts that made compromise possible. For example, he invented the idea of self-executing and non-self-executing treaties and the idea of a dependent sovereignty as legal strategies for managing the conflict between Jacksonian democracy and the rights of indigenous tribes. Where did all this legal creativity come from? Unlike all the other great Virginian founders, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Lee, Marshall was born dirt poor. With his 14 brothers and sisters, he shared a two room log cabin, which was 400 square feet on the hard scrabble Virginia frontier where his father scratched out a living on a small farm. His only formal education was a single year of grammar school before he joined a Virginia regiment in 1775 at the age of 19. Marshall fought in the Great Battle of Norfolk, where the British leveled Norfolk, Virginia, the largest city and the largest state in the Union. The image of that city on fire was burned into his memory. 
he witnessed there the fragility of human society and the imperative of a strong military to defend us. That, I think, shaped his conservatism. He, he was a progressive conservative in the mode of Hamilton and Edmund Burke. He believed in a strong central government to protect the nation's security and the primacy of individual liberty and property rights. He also favored the modernizing influence of commerce to replace the agrarian slave economy. At Valley Forge, George Washington was sufficiently impressed by the young man that he appointed Marshall Judge Advocate General of the US Army before Marshall had ever attended law school. And after his military service, Marshall decided to spend six weeks at the College of William and Mary attending law lectures. He was probably there because Polly Ambler just happened to be in uh, Williamstown at the time and he wanted to have an excuse for hanging around her. But that was his only legal education, six weeks. My law students would probably be envious. A and yet within the decade, he was one of the leading members of the bar in Richmond, Virginia. He was elected to the House of Delegates and appointed the youngest member of the Executive Council of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And as a legislator, he fought for laws to liberalize the manumission of enslaved persons and to allow intermarriage between Native Americans and whites. And at the Virginia Convention to ratify the Constitution, there was James Madison and John Marshall. They were the two leading proponents for ratification, facing off against Patrick Henry, the first governor and a great hero of the Commonwealth. Madison was a brilliant theorist, but he was a little too dour and awkward and nerdy to really be well-liked. Marshall, on the other hand, was the indispensable man who schmoozed the delegates over drinks at his favorite Richmond Tavern. Marshall managed to persuade just enough delegates that the Constitution passed by a slender margin of 10 votes. Without Marshall, there's little question that Virginia might not have ratified the Constitution. And without Virginia, there's no question there would be no republic. President John Adams later decides to send Marshall and two others, Elbridge Gary, that is Elbridge Gary of the gerrymandering fame, and Charles Coatsworth Pinckney on a secret mission to persuade revolutionary France to stop interfering with US ships carrying goods to Britain. And Marshall arrives in Paris in 1797 and he meets up with the French foreign minister, the notorious Monsieur Charles Maurice, Maurice de Talleyrand, who as a precondition to any negotiation demands a bribe in the equivalent of about $6 million plus a $400 million loan to finance the French war against Britain. Marshall refuses to pay Talleyrand anything and Talleyrand retaliates by seizing the Americans' passports and refusing to allow them safe passage to leave France. So for nine months, Marshall is trapped in Paris fighting Talleyrand. All the while, he's living with this charming woman who may or may not be the illegitimate daughter of Voltaire, Madame de Villette. And eventually, Marshall succumbs to her charms, not realizing that she is in fact a spy working for Talleyrand. And you'll have to read the book to find out what happens next. But eventually, Marshall returns home to the States and he's hailed as a hero for standing up to the French demands, even though he unwittingly triggered the quasi war with France in 1798. Marshall has no political ambitions and he just wants to return to his invalid wife, Polly and their 10 children in Richmond. But President Washington insists 
that Marshall has to run for Congress to oppose the growing influence of the Jeffersonians in Virginia. And Marshall is elected and heads to Philadelphia where Congress is still meeting. In Marshall's single term in Congress, he becomes the leader of the Federalists. He's the guy who actually gives the eulogy when George Washington passes away. But Marshall still wants to return home from Philadelphia and President Adams offers him a way out of Congress by appointing him to be Secretary of State during Adams' final year in office. Marshall figures he can accept the appointment as a way of leaving Congress and then leaving government at the end of Adams' term. So President Adams and John Marshall meet for the first time in a modest tavern in Washington, which is still under construction. Adams tells Marshall that since Abigail doesn't like the swampy climate of Washington, he's going home to Quincy, Massachusetts, and he's turning over the keys to the government to Marshall. Marshall is now in charge of every department in government except the military. He's in charge of passports, uh, patents, land grants. Uh, he oversees all of the US attorneys. He oversees the mint, the government press, the census, the territories, and of course, delivering the commissions. He must also supervise the completion of the White House, the Capitol building, and all of the roads and infrastructure for the new city before Congress convenes the following January. At the same time, France, Spain, Britain, and the Barbary pirates are all threatening to go to war against the United States. So Marshall is juggling all of this somehow with a staff of nine employees and the State Department budget of $15,000, which is just barely enough to cover salaries, firewood, and stationery. And, and the incredible thing is he does all of this brilliantly. Now, what does it say about a man who rises from poverty with no education to the highest levels of government and the judiciary. I believe that Marshall's genius for self-invention is how he developed the talent for inventing the law. So how is all of this relevant to our current moment? The insurrection on January 6 is still a fresh wound in our country's psyche. It demonstrated both the fragility of democracy and the resilience of our institutions. But, but for the courage of the Capitol Police and 62 courts that consistently rejected every attempt to overturn a free and fair election, our constitution would have been rendered void. Our politics today, however, are are no more ruthless or polarized than the politics of Marshall's day. He faced not one, but two constitutional crises, one precipitated by the Jeffersonians and later by the Jacksonians, both of which threatened the independence of our courts. What Marshall understood is the need for compromise. And he knew how to forge consensus where none seemed possible. He understood that what transcends partisan politics, what, what should unite the judiciary is a commitment to defend the legitimacy and the autonomy of the courts and the rule of law. The courts must be the guarantors of the principle that no person is above the law. The independence of our courts is the linchpin of our liberty. And without it, our Republic and our constitution are lost. If our liberty depends on the independence of our judiciary, then on whom do we depend when the judiciary itself is under attack as it has been? In the last several decades, we have witnessed pitched battles over the nomination of federal judges. We've seen a, 
President disparaged judges by name, expressed disdain for the judicial process and his own attorney general, and insists that he's above the law. We've seen the Senate routinely filibuster the nomination of dozens of qualified judicial nominees. And we've seen some members of Congress threaten to pack the court with like-minded judges. It's not just the political branches, however, that have demeaned and politicized our judiciary. Unfortunately, some judges have cast doubt on their own legitimacy as neutral arbiters of the law. The job of a judge or a justice is to set aside political loyalties and decide each case on its own merits. But when lawyers and law students can readily predict with astounding accuracy how certain judges will vote even before a case is heard, it suggests that those judges are putting party loyalty before the law. When the public perceives that the court is divided between the red shirts and the blue shirts, it undermines the public's respect for the judiciary. More and more often, as a professor of constitutional law, I find myself struggling to convince a skeptical class that the courts are about something more than party politics. The legitimacy of our judiciary is at stake if judges cannot set aside partisan politics and find common ground. Now, I, I know that even suggesting that common ground is a possibility in the current political environment makes me sound terribly naive. But John Marshall also lived in a highly partisan moment. And yet as Chief Justice, he found common ground by nurturing institutional loyalty. Every current judge and justice has something at stake beyond their party's political aims. And that is the legitimacy of the court itself. We need judges and justices who will strengthen the judiciary by setting aside their own political preferences and leaning in towards the center. We need jurists who hold their truths lightly in the common pursuit of consensus, who prefer compromise to confrontation, and who recognize and appreciate that moderation is a virtue. John Marshall was such a man. He had the courage of his imagination, the wisdom to find common ground, and the grace to hold together a fragile union. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Paul. It was a wonderful uh, a recital of uh, history and, and woven uh, into of our current environment. Uh, very well, and uh, we appreciate it very much. We're going to take some questions from the audience, and uh, if you have questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A section. We'll get to as many of those as possible. Um, I have a few, a couple uh, leading off uh, of my own, and as others are, are coming in, um, and, and one is, um, the, the Adams and, and uh, Jefferson rivalry was is well known and well documented. They seem to, by the end of their lives, patch that up a bit and uh, engage in correspondence, um, as we know. Did the Marshall and Jefferson rivalry ever get patched up by the end, uh, end of their lives? Uh no, definitely not. Um, they, they were really blood enemies throughout their lives. Um, I, uh, you know, from, from Jefferson's point of view, probably the worst thing John Adams could do to him was saddle him with John Marshall as his chief justice. Um, Jefferson was looking forward to appointing um, uh, someone else, Spencer Roan, who was then the president of the Virginia Supreme Court uh, as chief justice when he became he got elected. Um, and uh, Jefferson and the then Republican Party 
uh, really sort of set out to rid themselves of the Federalist judges. Uh, and they started out by um, uh, impeaching uh, uh, Judge uh, Addison in Pennsylvania. And they uh, impeached um, uh, Judge Pickering in New Hampshire. And then, of course, they impeached um, uh, Justice uh, Samuel Chase, who is better known as old Bacon Face Chase. Um, <laughs> And uh, Justice Chase, everybody understood, it, he was really the proxy for John Marshall, that the, the Republicans were really out to get John Marshall. Um, Marshall had been the leader of the Federalist Party in Virginia, while Jefferson was the head of the Republican Party. Um, uh, Marshall had been Washington's great defender at a time when Jefferson was really um, antagonistic to Washington's policy of neutrality towards France. So there was a long history here of, of rivalry between them. They never patched things up. And um, uh, I suppose in a sense, uh, it, it continues to this day in the rivalry between the Jeffersonians fans and, and Marshall's fans. <laughs> Did uh, Chief Justice Marshall own slave, hold slaves? Yeah, so Ch Chief Justice Marshall um, did not have clean hands on the subject of slavery. He owned um, at least about 15 household slaves at various points in his life. Um, a, uh, a recent book by Paul Finkelman has suggested that Marshall also owned a um, plantation that had more than 100 slaves on it. I, I, I'm somewhat skeptical of that in so far as Marshall um, not nowhere in his correspondence, nowhere in his in his diaries or his uh, account books, is there any reflection of having purchased or sold these slaves or received any income or expenses in connection with such a plantation. Um, I'm not sure that it matters. Marshall still held at least 15 household slaves. But Marshall's position on slavery was, was complex. Uh, he was a very strong opponent of slavery. Um, he, was, he was really castigated by various Southerners uh, throughout his term in, in Congress, in, in, uh, in the court, um, for having taken strong positions that everybody understood was really about slavery. So Marshall's decision in McCulloch versus Maryland mm -hmm. um, or Gibbons versus Ogden is really about whether or not Congress has enough authority to be able to regulate slavery out of existence. That's how his contemporaries perceived those decisions. And I think we have to bear that in mind. That, that, one, that's uh, very interesting. And one of the questions we had uh, was what evidence is it Marshall wanted Congress to have the power under the Commerce Clause to regulate slavery out of existence? Uh, what, what evidence do we have of that? What we, what we, I mean, the evidence we have is, 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 is his opinions uh, mm -hmm. in which he expressed a very broad view about Congress's powers. Um, in um, Culley versus Maryland, for example, uh, in addition to what appears in the opinion, Mar Marshall uh, requested Judge Johnson write a concurring decision. And most of Marshall's biographers agree that that Johnson's concurrence was actually either dictated by Marshall or that Marshall had something to, something to do with it. And in it, Johnson says that um, once Congress acts, all of the state laws fall lifeless from the, from the, from the statute books. And, and that was really Marshall's view about state's power. He really felt the states were in the way. He, he did not have a great deal of respect for state's rights. And the idea of state's rights at that time was really synonymous with the preservation of slavery. Um, moreover, as I say, the Southern press castigated Marshall because they saw him as threatening the institutions of slavery. And while he was practicing law in Richmond, Virginia, he took pro bono cases on behalf of slaves against their slave masters. Um. Thank you. Uh, another question from our audience is the uh, Marshall and Story relationship on and off the bench have a modern comparison. Um, uh, examples given are Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg and Murphy and Rutledge. Uh, 
Right. I, 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 that's exactly what comes to mind is the Ginsburg Scalia relationship, except that um, uh, the difference would be if Justice Scalia had persuaded Justice Ginsburg to think the way he thinks, because <laughs> just, just as Marshall, uh, Story was, a, of course, an extremely accomplished uh, uh, a jurist and, and legal scholar before he joined the court. And Story, who wrote all these great commentaries on, on American law, um, Story was really kind of, he, he, he was a Republican. He was a Jeffersonian before he joined the court. He joined the court and he was just, had this kind of magnetic attraction for Marshall's views and really became Marshall's uh, uh, greatest advocate and, and supporter. Uh, and, and their friendship, um, you know, lasted long after death. That sort of brings to mind maybe uh, Justice Brennan was a Republican appointee and sort of uh, certainly um, sided with Justice Marshall, Thurgood Marshall, on most uh, decisions. Was did you do you see a comparison there with the or was Justice Brennan more of that mind uh, from the outset. Yeah, well, so, so Justice Brennan was, um, I, I'm not sure that he was a Republican himself. I believe he made, he was a Democrat. He was appointed by, by President Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. um, he, Eisenhower appointed Brennan, um, uh, he, he saw Brennan as a moderate and as somebody who could get through Congress. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I think uh, Eisenhower used to say that, um, he only made two mistakes as president. Both of them were on the Supreme Court. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so Brennan was not exactly in the same camp with Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think a better example would be someone like Justice Souter. When Justice Souter was appointed by President Bush the first, mm -hmm. uh, he was Bush was assured by John Sununu, who knew Justice Souter quite well, that Justice Souter was a rock ribbed Republican conservative. And of course, Justice Souter proved to be, um, you know, more moderate and to move uh, perhaps closer to um, Justice Stevens in his views. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any justice who's had a similar impact to uh, the, the Chief Justice Marshall uh, on, on the nation? Can you draw any yeah, other comparison? I'm sorry, any Chief Justice, did you say? Any, well, just it, the question is it any justice. Uh, any justice, sure. Yes. Well, yeah, so I, you know, I would say that that uh, that certainly Justice Justice Story had an enormous impact in terms of uh, our understanding about the law today. Um, uh, justice Jackson, I think, um, had a great impact in terms of defining limits on presidential power and the relationship between the president and Congress. Um, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, there's a lot of justices come to mind. I mean, Justice, Justice uh, Holmes, of course, um, in terms of our understanding about the First Amendment and um, Justice Brandeis, insofar as Justice Brandeis was really, um, uh, uh, Justice Brandeis could have transformed a lot of our thinking about law uh, in terms, but of course he did much of that before when he was in practice of law, the way in mm -hmm. which he introduced social science uh, to the law. Um, what would, uh, next question we have is what would Justice Marshall have thought either in writing or in your research, including Washington's dislike of political factions? What would uh, Justice Marshall have thought of Jefferson's self-interested desire to make Virginia a winner-take-all jurisdiction in the Electoral College to avoid the tie vote scenario repeating uh, that resulted in Adams becoming the second president? Long question, but with a lot in it. <laughs> um, so I, I, I lost the first part of the question, I'm sorry. Uh, what would Justice Marshall have thought of Jefferson's self-interested desire to make Virginia, uh, Virginia a winner-take-all jurisdiction? Oh, winner-take-all state. The, okay, that's in, in the electorate. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure that I can answer that question confidently. Um, I, I think that. Um, I think that Marshall and, of course, the framers of our Constitution had a very different understanding about the Electoral College altogether, uh, insofar as they, um, 
Uh, they were certainly not populists. They didn't believe in a popular vote to elect the president. They thought that the Electoral College would function um, uh, as kind of a council of wise men who would advise about who should be the president. Um, that was the understanding of, of Madison and, um, and, and uh, today, you know, we think about the, the Electoral College as kind of an obstacle, as something kind of in the way to a popular vote, but that's only because we presume that the people should directly elect the president. Their understanding was, let's get together a bunch of smart, wise people with good judgment and have them choose the person with the best character. Um, I think that um, Marshall was certainly alarmed by the populism of, for example, Andrew Jackson. Uh, and in fact, that was the one arguably the one mistake he made uh, as, as uh, Chief Justice was that he, he once uh, commented publicly on what a tragic event it would be if Andrew Jackson was elected president. <clears throat> I think history proved him right, but that's my view. Um, but he, 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 uh, he, he certainly saw populism uh, as the enemy uh, of the Constitution and of the values of the Constitution. I think we have time for one last question, and I see one coming in, and that is, uh, what would um, Chief Justice Marshall thought about concepts such as originalism uh, that we see today? Well, <clears throat> um, uh, Marshall would have been puzzled <laughs> by the concept of originalism uh, in the following way. If you think back to Marbury versus Madison, Marshall was telling Madison what the Constitution meant. Madison drafted the Constitution. <clears throat> Marshall didn't feel that there was any reason why Madison had a monopoly on, on the meaning or the significance of the Constitution. Constitutional scholars have pointed out that you know, the framers of our Constitution met in secret they didn't keep an official record because they didn't want people to focus on what their intention was. They wanted people to focus on the words in the Constitution and in our contemporary understanding. When Marshall says in McCulloch versus Maryland, we should forget that we are, this is the Constitution we are expounding, he's saying there that the Constitution isn't like any other document. It isn't like a statute. It is, it's a vehicle for moving forward, moving the country forward. And it's, it's organic, it's changing over time. His view of the constitution was the constitution should evolve. And I think that the success of our constitution, it's, it's survival for two centuries, more than two centuries. And the success of our society and of our form of government ha has much to do with the wisdom that Supreme Court justices have brought to the interpretation of the Constitution over time. And I think that was Marshall's view about how the Constitution should be read. Thank you very much, Professor Paul. This was uh, most enlightening and, and uh, inspiring. And I'm glad we, uh, we have questions from our audience that reflect that as well. Uh, we wanna, uh, I wanna remind the audience that the, uh, uh, members who signed up uh, here. Uh, there are copies of his book, Without Precedence, and I'm going to hold it up for the uh, camera to, to, uh, uh, for you to see. They're still available from the Society's gift shop. You can, uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, you can find it at www.supremecourtgifts.org. It is a fun read and uh, you'll get much out of it, I'm sure. Because this is a new format uh, and then a new experience for the society um, and our members, a survey will go out later, uh, later this evening, actually, to everyone who registered in advance. We encourage you to respond to the survey. We want to make these programs as uh, interesting and accessible to as many people as possible. And we're grateful for your participation and signing up uh, to hear the program. For more information about the Society and future events, please visit our website, www.supremecourthistory.org.
www.ncpsf.org. And uh, we want to thank you all again, and a special thanks to Professor Paul for joining us today and his comments. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And we are adjourned. <laughs>